sometimes we need to pull the, the rug under the feet, if you like, um, to actually cause a individual to want to get help. Hello, everyone. I'm Dan. Welcome to another episode of 98.5 Table Talk. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited for our guests. Today, we have Steve Hall, who is the Executive Director of Adult and Teen Challenge, as well as Phil Palmer, who is part of the Community Service Team. Welcome, guys. Good to have Thank you here. You, Thank you. Thank you for awesome. having us. What are you bringing to the table? Well, look, today we want to have a chat about the whole area of, we know drug addiction mm -hmm. um, impacts the individual, but we'll have a look at the idea that it actually involves the whole family. Yes. In fact, addiction is like a ripple effect. Um, it starts with the individual, but we see families, and not just families, but siblings, um, friends, all get impacted by the whole crisis that happens in addiction. And we want to have a chat about that because as Adult and Teen Challenge, we've been working on a seminar for the community to look at how do you enable the community to be the solution mm. um, rather than simply trying to react to it and sometimes making it worse. Absolutely. So let's 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 stay with you for a sec, Steve. So why is it important to treat drug addiction? You, just, you touched on it a little bit there, but why is it so important to, to treat it as a family crisis rather than just an individual crisis? Well, I think it's, 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 it is, you've got to have it as an individual crisis, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I think what we're saying is that the family are hugely impacted. So how the family responds um, is going to determine whether the person can make that decision to get out. Sometimes we need to pull the, the rug under the feet, if you like, um, to actually cause a individual to want to get help. And that's what we want to try and talk about today. How do we do that? And I know Phil has his own story in that area. Phil, well, Phil, let's let's hear it. Can you share a bit of your um, your story and your experiences with Adult sure, Routine Challenge? Sure, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so I spent 20 years, a better part of two decades, um, as a drug addict and an alcoholic. And, um, and it wasn't until that I had got um, into that part of my life where I was ready to rehabilitate, I actually hadn't realised the devastating effect that mm. I'd actually had on my family, but also on my own personal life as well. Um, you know, I was spiritually depleted, I was emotionally depleted, um, and I was physically um, unwell. And the pressure that it put on my family during that time, I, I lost my relationship with my daughter. Um, you know, I had f burnt all bridges with, with friends and, um, and, and, and it put immense strain on, on my family for, for the better part of 20 years. Mm -hmm. And it was the, the, you know, the lasting effect that it had, especially on my mum and my daughter especially, um, you know, that, that helped me bring me to that point where you know, I had to start looking at some drastic changes. Um, when we're caught up in addiction, we're very selfish and we're very self-absorbed and we're very focused on what's going uh, on for, for ourselves. Um, and I spent a lot of time blaming everybody else for the way that I was and not taking that responsibility yeah, sure. on board. Um, you know, and so it's only after sort of coming out the other side of that that you realise... Um, some of the everlasting damage that you that you, you, you inflict on your family. Yeah, absolutely. Um, through the the selfish life choices that you make. Sure. So it sounds like you would you would wholeheartedly agree that it is a, a family crisis, not just an individual. Crisis. Look, absolutely. I mean, I know from personal experience the damage that I did to my own family um, through through addiction and alcoholism. But I've seen in my role um, at Adult and Teen Challenge and the and the phone calls that I get on a daily basis with families crying out. Mm because they want help for their loved ones. Uh, we're seeing marriages being torn mm -hmm. apart. We're seeing um, mums and dads being estranged from their children. We're seeing grandparents yeah. um, raising kids because mum and dad are trapped in addiction. Um, it has a massive impact on, on the family family unit. Um, but, but there definitely is a way out of that. Yeah, there for sure. There definitely is a way out. So for you, in your story, what was the, what was the actual turning point in your, your life and your story? So I remember vividly an, an instant where um, I was at, at the Armadale Kelmscott Hospital in their emergency ward and, and I had no shoes on. I was wearing a pair of shorts and a, and a singlet and, and I had no money. I had nowhere to go. And I remember sitting on that payphone and bawling my eyes out to my mum and dad, 
begging them to let me come home. Please, I promise I will change. I promise things will be different. And my mum crying on the other end of the phone saying, son, we love you so much, but we are not in a position to be able to help you. Yeah, right. We are at that point after, tr you know, journeying with you for, for such a long time that we're not in a position to be able to help you. You know, son, what it is that you need to do. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, until you get the help that you need, we don't have a place for you yeah, here. Right. Um, yep. And they had to allow... They had to allow me to reap the consequences of my choices. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, that's half of parenting, isn't it? You know, you have to. You, there's the good parts and there's the bad parts, and that sounds like a bad part. I've never had to yeah. go through that with my seven-year-old. <laughs> Hopefully, I never have. To. No, no. no. He, he, he's seven. Yes, no. he's a strong will. He's a strong willed little man. So who knows? <laughs> who knows? But that's okay. So let's go back to the the top. We were talking about enabling and empowering. So how does that fit in to all of this? Is that you, Steve? And I guess, I guess you know, what I, I, I hear from Phil's story and, um, is you want to yeah. be able to say, we identify the pain yeah. that family go. Everyone focuses on the addict, but there is incredible pain and heartache. I mean, you've got a loved one that you just really, really want to just – you just want the pain to go away. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I've sat with families where they've actually – um, the family ends up having a big argument about the way to respond to the yeah. sibling that's that's mm. going through the um, the addiction, and and it just rips families apart. And there's a pain in that. So when we do our seminars, we talk about well, how does someone move? Because you don't actually start off as an addict. You didn't get up one morning and go, woohoo, let's have a let's become a career as a as an yeah. addict. It doesn't yeah. happen that way. Yeah. Um, it starts off. And so what was the start? What's the trigger point? And in our seminar, we have a chat about that. Mm -hmm. we, we talk through that. Phil, who heads up our student and community services yeah, cool. um, with the guys, he actually speaks into that, not just from his mm -hmm. own experience, but also from those of the, the students that we're mm -hmm. helping. But the word for enabling, <coughs> if you had to look at the definition, it says enabling describes someone whose behaviour allows a loved one to continue self-destruction pat destructive patterns or behavior yeah, wow. in other words my response is that which is actually helping the destructive behavior one comment that we've had here is most people who enable loved ones don't intend to cause harm enabling generally begins with the desire to help so I want to help. I want to take this away. Mm -hmm. um, I want to believe it's going to be all right, but my response ends up enabling. Yep. Um, and when we talk about that and things like, well, look, let me pay the bill. Let me, look, it's going to be all right. One, one more, you know, mm -hmm. I won't do it anymore, mum and dad, you know, yeah. and, uh, and yet you know that they will. Um, and so the, the, the heart of this whole enabling, we've got to understand it. It doesn't come from being a bad parent. No. It actually starts because you want to be a good parent. Yeah. It's, it sounds um, easier, doesn't it? It sounds, it. Like the, it sounds like the right thing to it do. It does. Yeah. And, you, and you just want it to go away yeah. um, because it's, it's destroying your heart. But it's not a good thing. So we want to talk about that in a real way, in a real sense of being able to identify the pain. Yeah. But then what would it mean to empower yeah, to right. actually empower someone to make the change they mm -hmm. need so they can have a better future. And Phil talks into that, don't you, Phil, about what does it mean to empower? Yeah, so the, the first first point we want to look at when we want to empower someone to get to the point of change, um, like my mum had to do with me, and that's, mm -hmm. and that's putting um, firm boundaries in mm -hmm. place. Um, it's making sure that you allow... Um, the natural consequences that are going to come from poor life choices mm -hmm. to take effect. Um, they are the two of the probably the most crucial steps you can take to make sure that you're in, empowering your loved one to change. It also comes back to, you know, not financially supporting them in any way, making sure that, um, you know, you're not putting a roof over their head, that you're allowing the consequences for their bad choices to take effect. Yeah, right. um, making sure that the family as a whole is on the same page. Yep. Make sure brothers and sisters are on the same page. Make sure your uncles and aunts and grandparents. Mm -hmm. And if the whole family is working collectively mm -hmm. um, as uh, you know as a group they can empower the person who's struggling with addiction to change a lot quicker if you have a addict who is still living at home um, mum and dad may still be supporting or enabling their their choice of lifestyle you can have the potential to drag out a loved one's addiction process by 10 even 15 years yeah, wow so the family <coughs> as a group um, I, I think underestimate the power that they have to help their loved one change. Mm -hmm. 
in the end it does come down to the fact of the individual wanting to make that change. I mean, as I tell my families that, that I speak to you over the phone um, and, and through interviews and intakes is, is you can take a horse to water but you can't make it drink. Absolutely. We can show them where the water is and we can guide them together as a family to show them where the water is but then it's up to them um, whether they choose to drink that water or absolutely, not. Absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. I think that, I, you know, I have no experience like you guys do, but just through doing like youth ministry and stuff like that, kids can change, but they have to want to change. Yeah, absolutely. And you can do all the support you want, but ultimately you have to empower them to actually change. So look, this has been amazing. We could talk for hours and hours and hours about this, but we got to go because this is table talk and it's short. (laughs) But thank you so much for joining us, guys. It's been awesome. And thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure to have you and uh, stick around for more table talk. Mm -hmm.